thank you. It is uh, a great honor and privilege. Are you getting back feed? Yes, it's good? Oh. We're doing field methods together so we can test the mics. Uh, so it's a privilege and honor to introduce Tony here. It's actually also very intimidating. Uh, for those of you who are in Hawaii at the uh, ICLDC conference, in the International Conference of Language Documentation and Conservation, Andrew Garrett uh, introduced Tony at the time. He was a keynote speaker there, and Andrew gave an absolutely brilliant introduction. So I feel intimidated coming after Andrew. Andrew did quite graciously send me all of his slides and his text. And I said, because there's one piece I wanted, which we'll come to, and I, I said, if you, you know, I, I will give you, I will quote you. And he said, oh, you don't have to give me it. Don't quote me, you just use it. And that felt kind of weird, <laughs> like plagiarism. So I'm not gonna do that, but um, I am grateful to Andrew for that. And it's also intimidating because Tony is a very good friend. I know people have been saying when they first met the speaker, and I can't remember when I first met Tony. So Tony is here as the Hale Professor, as Carlos said. The Hale Professor was established in 2003 by the LSA as a way to address the strongly felt need in our profession to document endangered languages and work with communities toward their preservation. The establishment of this professorship really created a huge buzz for those of us who do field work. The, the fact that the LSA formally recognized the importance of it. Hale's dedication to the study and preservation of endangered languages is legendary. And so the professorship ensures that students have access to courses that prepare them to do investigation of poorly documented languages, even if their own institutions do not offer them. The professorship is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and so we are very indebted to them too. Uh, Ken was a linguistic superhero, and I also feel funny talking about Ken Hale here. There are people, his colleagues uh, from MIT who knew him much better than I did. But here are a few key points for those of you, particularly the younger people in the room who may never have had the luck to meet Ken. He had an extraordinary near mythical ability to learn languages. I do not know how many languages he knew. I can tell you in researching this to find out, the number kept growing with every source that I found, like the number of snow words in the languages that Tony and I both work on. The New York Times reported 50 in 2001. I've seen counts of 100. Uh, I don't know, but if you, hear, if you ever are lucky enough to hear recordings of Ken doing field work, it's unbelievable. If there are a linguistic fairy godmother and I could have anything, wealth, thinness, Ken's brain, I would go for his brain. Uh, second point, he's made significant contributions to linguistic theory. As I wrote this, it looked like a really flat bullet point. But the fact is that he exemplified empirically driven linguistic theory. He took his own deep knowledge of a vast number of typologically different languages and brought them to theory. So for example, he's quite famously known for classifying languages as non-configurational and looking at what the properties meant and looking for a way to unify uh, how properties of non-configurational languages cl cluster together. And Ken was deeply dedicated to the education and promotion of native speaker linguists, building capacity and really working within communities. Some of his students include Ophelia Zepeda, who's Tohono O'odham, Paul Platero, Marianne Willey, Elevina Perkins, all Navajo, and Jesse Little Dobear of Wampanoag, so names you probably know. There are many, many, many things one could say about Ken, and I could go on all night, but you want to hear Tony. But since I have the floor, I decided to pick one that I care about passionately. And this has to do with language endangerment. In 19, uh, Ken organized a symposium on endangered languages for the LSA in 1991. The collection of papers was published in language in 1992. And the symposium, the resulting publication that, and I should say Ken edited the essays, they're all part of a movement that resulted in an increased interest in linguistic field work and key developments in our field, including not only the obvious effects of language documentation, but also in the LSA, a standing committee for ethics and code of ethics. Until this was developed in the LSA, we were using the Anthropological Association's code of ethics. We did not have our own. Uh, increased attention to archiving both for preserving data and making it accessible to multiple users, 
and a renewed emphasis on the role of empirical data in linguistic theories. So with that overview of Ken, I can think of no one better than Tony to be the Ken Hale professor. Here are just a few key dates in his biography. He holds a BA MA from the University of Chicago. In 1975, he wrote an MA thesis on ergativity, directed by Jerry Sadek. And this thesis is still cited, his MA thesis from 1975. We, Jerry and I have been working with uh, Greenlandic Eskimo Kalachi suits, as we call it now, and we required this thesis, this MA thesis, uh, for our students. He's a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1981, and you see that he was Murray Haas's student. He has been at UT Austin since 1981, and where he's been assistant, or 1980, I have two different dates here, uh, assistant associate full professor, chair of linguistics, and is also co-director of ILA, the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America. Like Ken, like Ken, Tony has a deep commitment to linguistic data and theory. His work is anchored in the study of language and use, socially and culturally anchored, and for him, language and linguistic patterns are deeply connected to culture. Tony works on very complicated topics, such as verbal poetics, natural discourse, tone, prosody, intonation, topics that require a deep knowledge of the language as a part of a holistic cultural system language that cannot be understood outside of its context and cannot be extracted or objectified with loss, without loss of the system itself. He is an expert in language documentation and preservation and works specifically in Chitino linguistics and out in what you think linguistics. Like Hale, Tony is a champion of training community members as linguists. Uh, for example, probably I think people in this audience know the names of Emiliana and Hilaria Cruz, both who are trained at uh, PhDs in linguistics at UT Austin, and Miliana is now an assistant professor at UMass Amherst, and Hilaria is starting a postdoc at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Ken and Tony were both at a conference that Lindsay Whaley and I organized in 1995, and so I have pictures there. You can't see. There's Michael Krause looking very young. Colette, well, everybody's looking young in 1995. Even you guys, the young guys were looking really young in 1995. Uh, 95, I, I don't have any pictures of, they were there together, but I don't have any pictures of Tony with Ken from that event and any, any event to paste him in there. I wanted to surprise him, but if you look on the web for images of Tony, you'll see a lot of head images. So anything I did just had this kind of disembodied head floating above and it didn't look good. Uh, but he was there. <laughs> so. And finally, uh, as I said, uh, Andrew gave him a very brilliant dis uh, introduction, and I would like to highlight Tony's one last contribution of Tony, uh, which was, to the best of my knowledge, first identified and defined by Andrew Garrett in his introduction. He identified the phenomenon known as Woodbury's Law. And I feel no introduction to Tony would be complete without it. Uh, the thing is, fieldwork and documentary linguistics get criticized as data collection that is allegedly not concerned with generalizations. But, as Andrew pointed out, Woodbury's law is at least a tendency and may be an exceptionless law of language documentation. So if we look at Franz Boas, Jürgen Rischel, Tony himself, Gary Holton, you will see people who began doing fieldwork in the Arctic and then move to the tropics. <laughs> uh, neither Andrew nor I are aware of any changes in the opposite direction. <laughs> the causes of Woodbury's law remain elusive. <laughs> At the reception, we can take a casual poll and you will see that it actually pans out. So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming and I will pass the floor over to Tony. Thanks so much, Lenore. I uh, was going to try to get the slides from Andrew's forum lecture last week, but I um, <laughs> guess I didn't think of that. But um, I want to, first of all, uh, thank the, uh, the people who have put on this wonderful institute, Carlos Allen and Laura especially, uh, for all of the work and the wonderful uh, institute that they've put together. 
And uh, I'm so happy that it's here at the University of Chicago, where, as Lenore said, I uh, uh, toiled in the, in the fields 40 years ago and more. Um, I am honored especially to be giving the Ken Hale Lecture uh, in honor of someone who I knew and admired so much and whose aspirations for descriptive linguistics and for our discipline as a whole uh, I have tried to follow. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint rolling here. So my talk is titled The Genius of the Language Discovering Pervasive Plan and um, yeah, discovering pervasive plan and unique design and linguistic description. Uh, as linguists, most of us first encounter the intriguing phrase, the genius of language, in Edward Sapir's uh, uh, 1921 book, Language. Sapir sometimes uses it to mean a language particular rule, um, uh, <coughs> a, a, a sense of, a, a, which was a, is a sense of it that uh, has been around for quite a while. So for example, the application of the principle of concord varies considerably uh, according to the genius of the particular language. Uh, but he sometimes used it to mean, uh, uh, to uh, posit a, a language's pervasive plan or its unique design. So in this uh, often quoted quote, he says, for it must be obvious to anyone that uh, who, has, who has thought about the question at all, or who, felt, who has felt something of the spirit of a foreign language, that there is such a thing as a plan, a certain cut to each language. This type, this type or plan or structural genius of the language is something much more fundamental, much more pervasive than any single feature of it uh, uh, than we can mention, nor can we, uh, uh, can we gain an adequate idea of its nature by a mere recital of the sundry uh, facts that make up the grammar of the language. Um, So here had in mind a novel typological scheme centered on the interrelationship of morphological function, uh, stem derivation and inflection uh, with levels of, uh, levels of uh, or, and degrees of lexical co uh, concreteness. Um, and his goal was to identify and explain tendencies of languages to undergo changes in accordance with their special structural geniuses, which he called drift. But this special project notwithstanding, uh, Sapir's use of the phrase had quite a zing, and it had a considerable influence. Uh, it's had a considerable influence on grammar writing and other descriptive linguistic writing. So, for example, uh, Nick Evans and Alan Dench. Um, Nick Evans was the uh, Hale professor four years ago. <coughs> say this in a book on grammar writing: an emphasis on system systematic integration and on recognizing the overall architecture of a language has dominated linguistics since the structural era. The idea of an essential genius of a language drives descriptive grammarians to look for a, uh, for a characteristic overall Bauplan that makes sense, makes sense of the language's particu uh, particularities in an integrated way. At the same time, grammarians need to keep an open mind on how far traits are, are in fact free to vary independently or following the structuralist dictum hold each other together. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, Karen Rice, who was the Hale professor two years ago, uh, uh, has, uh, with, in, in a paper with a nice title, Let the Language Tell Its Story, the Role of Linguistic Theory in Writing Grammars, says, uh, in the largest sense, a grammar should express what Sapir refers to as the genius of the language, the genius, uh, the genius of a language, a phrase used often by Sapir is what uh, the grammarian ultimately hopes to capture. What is the genius of the language? How can one encapsulate it in a grammar? Well, this is how I would like to frame Karen's question for purposes of this talk. When we're, when we're engaged in language documentation and description, we encounter language, our own language, or else somebody else's language, as natural speech embedded in, uh, <coughs> embedded in a set of communicative habits and practices, and as knowledge and ability in speakers. We assume that all of this is the complex product of human ingenuity and historical accident, and that it, is also, that it is also shaped by tendencies in how we process and use language and by our biological capacities and limitations. So can we find among these particularities a system or set of systems in which, as Mayhe said, everything hangs together? Can we identify pervasive and possibly unique features and interrelationships? Well, my purpose in this talk is to discuss some examples 
where linguists make claims about a pervasive plan and unique design in their writing on particular languages uh, to distinguish this genre from explanation or treatment in historical, typological, or universal terms, um, to all of which, uh, of course, this genre um, still makes important heuristic contributions and substantive contributions as well. Um, and then to say that this kind of integrative thinking is a really part of the essential contribution of what field, uh, field workers do, what people do when they engage in descriptive and documentary linguistics. And I wanna urge descriptive grammarians and those who follow their work to really make space for this kind of work. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'm gonna first go uh, give some examples of what I'm talking about uh, coming from language descriptions that I like very much. Um, I'm then going to talk about two uh, cases in more detail from my own, uh, my own linguistic work, uh, one on Yupik Inuit and one on Chetino, and then I'll end up with a few, uh, a few conclusions. So let's start out with a survey of examples from language descriptions. Um, a very good place to begin is with the work of Ken Hale. Uh, he begins uh, his well-known 1983 article on non-configurationality as follows. He says, the grammar of Walbury in Australian Aboriginal languages, Central uh, Australia, exhibits a number of properties which have come to be associated with the typological label non-configurational, including, among others, free word order, the use of syntactically dis discontinuous constituents, uh, expressions, and extensive use of null, uh, of, of null onaphora. Um, in his discussion, Ken argues further that uh, despite this non-configurationality, Walbury, uh, Walbury subjects enter into reflexivization uh, uh, and control constructions and um, uh, in ways that are similar to subjects in languages lacking um, these kinds of typical non-configurational non properties. And so the main point of his article uh, was to offer a theoretical model to capture this whole pattern of facts. Really his beginning point was quite evidently a rich characterization of what he saw uh, as a pervasive system that hangs together. And when read in that way, I think one finds in the article itself and in his, uh, and in his other work on Walbury, a theory of that system that also includes such phenomena as the major, uh, 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 as the major morphologically defining uh, defined parts of speech being verbs versus everything else, and uh, the, the uh, phenomenon where nominals are susceptible to uh, what he called argumentative, argumental and predicative interpretation. So all of these were part of a much larger and richer uh, pattern of facts that he uh, saw as hanging together in some ways explained through his, uh, his, his effort to make a, a uh, typological um, uh, analysis, but also in a broader sense, hanging together uh, within an eco ecology of the language itself. Um, another case that I like very much, also dealing with the language of Australia, is uh, based uh, by Jeffrey Heath, based on his 1984 extensive grammar texts and dictionary of Nungubuyu, a language of Arnhem Land in North, uh, Northern Australia. And in a 1986 article in NLLP, he gives what I think is a really excellent example of uh, this kind of pervasive design. So he says, Nungubuyu is more radically non-configurational than Walbury, particularly in lacking clear evidence uh, for a subject VP split. The breakup of NP segments, which works much as in Walbury, is interpreted uh, as a result of the autonomy of words and the freedom with which they, which referentially identical or overlapping words may be juxtaposed. Um, so he uh, goes on uh, to say that regardless of how we decide to model un underlying structures in this language, non-configurational non syntax is a basic fact of observable, uh, observable surface structures. So it's a kind of, of, of habit or a kind of, of uh, favorite construction in the language. Um, so the various jobs that a grammar must do if speakers are to succeed in communicating must, uh, uh, communicating must be carried out in this context. Um, this includes the expression of complex concepts which are most easily handled by tightly knit phrasal structures 
including possessor-possessive combinations, nominal conjunctions, and qu quantified nouns. Um, there, and uh, and uh, there must be some, uh, also some mechanism for making the scope of negation and boundaries between main and subordinate clause uh, as in between and making um, and boundaries between main and subordinated propositions. So uh, basically everything sort of uh, seems to fall apart on the surface and he cites, for example, as uh, just to give you an example of this kind of compensation, he talks about what he calls neg indexing in Mungu Buyu. So if you have a sentence um, that's not negated, um, such as that in A, a kangaroo saw me yesterday in the grass, to negate it, you put the, neg ne you put the negative particle at the beginning and then you mark everything with a, uh, what he calls a negative index, a classifier in the, in the case of, of nominals and a change in the, in the, person, uh, the person marker in the case of, of verbs. So basically you're tagging everything. So that's an example of that kind of, uh, that kind of, of, of explanation or that kind of connection that he sees. So we can observe, of course, that both Ken Hale's and Jeff Heath's expl explanatory mechanisms are quite different. Um, they're uh, trying to explain things in different kinds of terms, but there's something that binds their approaches together, and that is the dri a drive towards characterizing unique constellations of features as systems, and in so doing, generating general ideas about grammatical independent, uh, interdependency. Another more recent uh, example that I like very much is Birgit Helvig's um, Grammar of Goe Maya, a language of spoken in Chad. So in this, um, uh, in this, uh, or no, sorry, it's a Chadic language spoken in central Nigeria. Um, so she systematically discusses many typological features of the language, it's tonal, it's isolating, it's SVO, and so on. But then she says, um, <coughs> As she says, Edward Sapir speaks about the genius of a language, that is the logic that underlies it and, uh, and that makes it unique and that motivates its grammatical structures. So for Goi uh, Mai, uh, it can be argued, she says, that, uh, that its grammar is driven by its verbal and nominal lexicalization patterns combined with the scarcity of overt morphology. Um, she goes on to say, <coughs> um, two predominant lexicalization patterns deserve to be highlighted. First, the verbal lexicon is characterized by a large number of state change, state change verbs with only, uh, only few activity and stative verbs. This includes the predominant lexicalization of property or adjectival concepts as state change verbs, which is pretty exotic, I think. Um, so secondly, uh, both the verbal lexicon and the nominal lexicon are characterized by semantic generality. So many nouns have neutralize number distinctions and don't distinguish between entities and their produce, and many verbs allow for the expression of different thematic roles, transitivity values, and lexical aspect categories. So as a result, a large part of going my grammar consists of strategies uh, that fill the, fill the gaps uh, in these lexicalization patterns, that is, that create stative and active expressions or that derive abstract nouns and that restrict the meaning potential of expressions, that is, that allow for the categorization and classification of verbs and nouns. So an example of this um, would be where she says, there are five po uh, postural-based elements. Uh, in all contexts, um, going my speakers are required to choose one of the five elements and to thereby pay constant attention to the position of re reference in space. They are among the very few stative verbs of the language and the going, and going my employs them to create state of expre expression. So that just gives you a little bit of a taste of what she is up to, and I think it's especially interesting the ways in which she, uh, in this treatment, she finds a relationship between the basic lexical semantics of the, uh, of the lexical stock and relates that to features of the grammar. Uh, finally, uh, a wonderful example is Andrew Pauly's work on Callum, and uh, this also focuses on properties of the lexicon uh, and uh, is, is talked about in an article with the wonderful title, uh, the, uh, 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 wonderful title, A Language Which Defies Description by Ordinary Means. And 
<coughs> Polly, uh, especially in, uh, actually, especially in keeping with authors centuries earlier than Shapir, takes mastering the genius of the language to mean something a little bit different, actually. But this is actually a very well attested meaning going back as far as the um, 50, as the 16th century. Uh, there's a paper on that by Edward Stankiewicz. It's very interesting. Um, in any case, um, so he says, I was unable, um, uh, so he, he takes mastering the genius of, genius of the language to mean acquiring what might be called idiomatic competence, knowing how things are said by native speakers, not just grammatically, but idiomatically or normally. So he says, I was unable using a conventional grammar lexicon model to describe rigorously certain key features of this language. Um, so he says, verb stems are a closed set consisting of, of about 100 members. Speakers rely heavil, heavily on a, a small subset of these termed generic verbs. There are 15 generic verbs accounting for 89% of all verb occurrences in texts. And then he connects that with various design features. So uh, column speakers are very analytic and explicit, uh, more so, he says, than speakers of European languages in reporting the action components of events. And um, he says there are lots of, 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 of multi, multi word uh, verbal expressions and gives examples of a very, very, very uh, big serial construction that you see in C there. This means to massage, strike, rub, hold, come, ascend, hold, come, descend, do. And, um, uh, but he makes a further point about that. He uh, points out that, uh, that you actually, in speaking, uh, can have well-formed utterances that don't quite follow the expected scheme. So to say Mosak shot the pig in the garden, as in A there, it's grammatical, but it's not conventional. Conventional would be Mos Mosak shot the pig, which has come and stayed in the garden. So you kind of have to talk about uh, who gets there, how they get there, what happens, then how they left, and so on. And so that's really a kind of a cultural formula. It's not exactly something that um, he uh, considered to fit into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, the, 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 the schemas of the grammar. So in this sense, Polly uh, brings into the picture not only grammatical organization, but what Worf called fashions of speaking, the conventions built on top of, of grammar uh, and that have a kind of a cultural logic. So having gone through this, uh, uh, this set of examples, and there are many more, obviously, um, here are a couple of themes that are recurrent. So uh, all of these examples are quite varied, and that's natural. You would expect that in a project like this. But uh, there, one of the things that comes up is favored properties, properties that languages really go to town on. So free word order or discontinuous constituents, verb serialization, change of state roots, and so on. Um, another is that in the context of such favored pro properties, uh, uh, the communicative work um, uh, uh, motivates or makes space for further properties. So uh, that's something that was talked about in um, several of these cases. Um, and finally, the interdependence of predominant linguistic properties and predominant communicative practice, such as Pauli uh, uh, starts to talk about. So all of those um, give us a, uh, a kind of a first, uh, a first look at this. So now I want to talk about two further examples of what I think is genius in two uh, language families that I have worked on. And I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, what I call morpho morphological orthodoxy in Yupik Inuit languages. So uh, this begins with my first field work in 1978 in Chivak, Alaska, which you can see being pointed to by the red arrow. And this is me in Chivak with Leo and Mary Moses. Leo passed away two weeks ago, and I was very sad to hear about that. But um, uh, in any case, we were working together uh, in, in uh, uh, those times and, and for many years after that. Um, so this is the Yupik Inuit languages. Um, I am going to be talking about Chupik, which is a variety of Central Alaskan Yupik, and I'll be kind of uh, talking about Chupik, but what I say will mostly be true of all of them, of, of all of them except Aleut, which is a little bit different. Um, okay, so this notion of morphological orthodoxy, it's a very, very 
elegant but also a very prolific system. So first of all, suffixation is the only morphological mechanism in this in, in Yupik Inuit languages. There's no prefixation, no compounding, no nothing else. There's just uh, suffixation. Uh, it's also productive and prolific, so it does a lot of the work that's usually allocated to independent words in other languages. Um, sec uh, thirdly, suffixes historically are absolutely stable. Suffixes historically come from suffixes, and roots come from roots, and there's no crossover. Finally, uh, this morphological orthodoxy is pervasive with uh, very wide ranging, uh, ranging effects. And arguably, I think it leads to uh, what I'm gonna talk about is the genius of Yupik, uh, Yupik Inui. So we have to start with a classification of, the, uh, of basic lexemes. So lexemes, <coughs> uh, dictionary entries, um, can be bases, or roots or stems, which are uh, gonna be either nominals, verbs, or particles. And then the suffixes are called postbases, and the term actually refers to just those that are absolutely 100% productive. And they can be classified into those which derive verbs from nouns, those which derive nouns or verbs from nominals, nominals from verbs, verbs from verbs, nominals from nominals. So now let's uh, uh, look at a little bit of the grammar of them. So basically, you take a base, put a post base on it, and you've got another base. And you keep doing that until you stop doing that, and then at the end, you put an inflection on the end. So let's do that. So ibuchik is water boots, okay? That's a noun base. Um, to say make water boots, ibuchi li, with to make an um, li, okay? Ibuchi um, li uh, sta. One who, uh, adding one who does verbs. So now we have one, someone who makes water boots for one. Adding to have a noun, to have someone who makes water boots for one. Adding definitely not have someone who makes water boots for one with definitely not added to it. Now, one that definitely doesn't have someone who makes water boots from them. Now, and you notice we've been going back and forth between nominals and verbs and, no, and back again. So let's do another one. Oh, so it gives us the whole thing. You wanted to see the whole thing. So that's ibu chili stunk suvenailingo. And that means one that do definitely doesn't have someone who makes water boots for them. <coughs> Let's do another one. Ho yohani is a verb base meaning to be smiling. So uh, adding uh, suddenly, suddenly be smiling. Adding another, suddenly smiled. Adding another, suddenly smiled, but alas. <laughs> And then evidently suddenly smiled, but alas. And finally put an inflection on it. Evidently, um, he or she suddenly smiled, but alas. So basically, that's what I'm talking about. And so just to kind of go back and see what we just did, um, there's a kind of rudimentary post-based grammar that says that the post-base selects the category of the base to which it applies and determines the category of the resultant base. So a noun to verb post base selects a nominal base and it forms a verb base. Um, also, there's a, a post base scope rule. So a post base has scope over exactly the base that it selects. So for example, uh, here is a, uh, a base to, uh, uh, which would mean to say that someone will go out, so we have the will and then the say after that. Uh, if you reverse the order, you get um, a base that means will say that someone went out, so the scope follows the order of the, of the post bases. And so <clears throat> it's very important to show why and how this system actually is very expressively central in the language. So, there are several things we can point to. One is that there's a huge inventory of uh, these productive post bases. It's in the hundreds. Second, and this is true for all of the languages. Um, second, there's a wide range of meanings and grammatical functions that these post bases have. And third, the recursive base derivation rule is used pretty liberally. So let's examine all of those characteristics. So 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to race through, if you can uh, manage to read it, because I'm going to go so fast, you'll be in good shape. I just want to give you a little bit of a feeling of how, of what range of meanings get involved. So let's start with noun to noun post spaces. Some of them have a kind of a, a nominal function so that you can make all kinds of various um, uh, 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 ones with, where the record is related to the base nominal, so shown in one. In two, there's various measure um, kind of uh, uh, if, uh, uh, meanings that, it, uh, that, it, that they can have. Um, other noun-to-noun -noun post spaces are adjectival or adverbial in their function, so properties and certain kinds of adverbial meanings when they're put on demonstrative and time expressions. Um, the verb to noun post spaces, they do various kinds of nominalizations, argument nominalization, adjunct nominalization, action nominalization. The uh, noun to verb post spaces, the other direction, are basically verbs um, of kinds that normally are independent in, or that are independent in many languages. So the only copula in the language is one of these um, various kinds of compl complement taking verbs. There's no other way to say have than with a suffix or to lack with a, uh, except with a suffix, to run out of, to smell strongly of. The, the meanings get lexically fairly pungent. Um, then um, uh, also various other kinds of, of, of uh, verb meanings. Then when we get into the verb to verb, now we're really in Grand Central Station. There's uh, lots and lots of different uh, uh, kinds of verbal meanings from ones that are very, very verb, like to let, to ask, to say that, think that, wait for, tend to cause, etc., cetera, um, on to relatively grammatical ones that are voice related uh, and so on. And then with all kinds of modality meanings, ability, phases of accomplishment, and so on. Um, also among the verb to verb are all sorts of adverbial meanings. So basically, uh, there uh, are many, as you can see listed here, many kinds of adverbial meanings, some of them relatively grammatical, such as tense and negation, others um, more, uh, more lexical seeming. <coughs> so that basically shows all of, of the range, of, or shows some of the range of the kinds of meanings that are involved. So now the next point is, so how much recursion really is there in this uh, language? So, uh, there's a lot of different things people have said. Um, so uh, uh, Steve Jacobson says up to six uh, post spaces, rarely more. Um, Osito Mioka has examples with 10. Um, I decided to um, make an empirical test, and so I found that in a four-hour conversation among elders um, in the traditional men's house in Chivac, there were 3,489 words of the, them. Uh, uh, one had seven post spaces, three had six, uh, 14 had five, 63 had four, 225 had three, uh, 585 had two, a whole bunch had one, and then there were actually more than half had none. So um, it's something that is, uh, on average, not necessarily that high, but the potential for elaboration is very high, and people like doing that. They, they admire it, and they, they like it. Um, so, and then just to kind of show you how, uh, how kind of labile and facultative this is, there really are different standards in different languages. In Siberian Yupik, it's, uh, it's uh, Willem de Roos's impression was that it was less than in Central Yupik. Uh, in Kalashisut, um, Mike Fortescue says, up to 10 or more affixes in succession before the inflectional ending is not, not particularly unusual, except uh, especially in the, in the written language. So, Basically then the problem is, how can the binary left branching suffixing structures of Yupik Inuit be sufficient for such extensive varied linguistic work? Uh, it's uh, basically a very, very elegant, but maybe too elegant formal setup. Well, my answer is that it isn't. Um, that there are all kinds of anomalies, exceptions, and other stretching of the principles of base formation, and especially of the scope rule. And these anomalies can be referred to the grammatical or semantic content of individual post spaces in keeping with the behavior associated with that content in less synthetic languages or in languages with more heterodox morphology. Uh, part of the genius, then, I think, lies in this tension. Um, so, for example, here are some noun to verb post spaces. I have a kayak, I don't have any seal 
boots, I'm eating king salmon, um, I'm tired of tomcods, I'm building a house that smells like smoke. Um, now these uh, formations um, give you constructions that look a lot like noun incorporation constructions and tons of ink has been spilt on whether they're really noun incorporation constructions or not. Uh, the fact that they involve suffixes rather than compounding rules them out for some people. Um, so we have, for example, I have a house, okay, that's fine. Um, I have one house made of ice. So basically you can see it's I house have with ice with one. And so basically the scope seems to be extending a little bit beyond the, uh, the original base. Um, also, uh, just to give you as a comparison, if I want to say using a normal ver a verb to see, I see one house made of ice, I use that same, uh, uh, same um, uh, instrumental case to mark the uh, notional direct object. So um, these noun uh, incorporation formations uncannily do all, all of the, many of the same things that noun incorporation constructions do in, 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 in official noun incorporating languages like Iroquoian. So for example, there's this principle in Iroquoian where if you have a noun incorporation, the incorporated noun, um, if it doubles the stranded noun, has to be more specific, or uh, less specific. So it's okay, and that's true in Yupik too. So you can say when they, have, when they fish have um, with blackfish, that's fine, but uh, when they fish have, uh, or when they blackfish have with fish, that's no good. So, so basically, um, the noun to verb post bases like this have acts in some respects like a verb taking a multi word NP complement and having scope over it. And the pattern, as I said, mimics, mimics noun incorporation in languages with classic noun incorporation. Um, so basically, um, this would be an example of that kind of, 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 of stretching, of a glitch where there's a, uh, where a certain set of expressive possibilities are realized by breaking the rules. Um, another case, uh, supposedly, uh, so what I've talked about uh, is a kind of, of local semantically based ordering of post bases. But in fact, there's a little secret that was first um, broached by Michael Fortescue in 1980, and that is that there is some templatic ordering going on among these uh, affixes. And so this is a little scheme that I figured out for Yupik of how to, uh, uh, of, of, of templatic ordering. So basically of these post bases that I've listed, these six categories, well, there's five categories and then the inflection, these guys all line up in this order and they have to go right before the inflection. So this is, these are some examples that show it. Uh, you can, uh, we're not gonna go through all of them, but the first one, for example, just shows you that um, you gotta have it in a certain order and turning the order around won't work. Um, so, uh, so there again, you have a case of a kind of pattern that's very common in uh, many languages, the ordering of particular kinds of categories, very often those same categories, but uh, they are uh, uh, turning up in, in, in this system that strictly speaking isn't supposed to be, uh, supposed to be able to do that. So now a third case um, uh, is uh, what I call epithet, epithet post bases that have a very strange scope behavior. So they're, uh, normally they turn up in noun to noun, uh, as noun to noun post, post bases. So poor deer, village, funky man, darn kaifuck, um, baby gulls, okay, but, you can also use them on verbs. And when you use them on verbs, they implicate the, uh, some argument of the, uh, in the clause. So if I say uh, that what would actually mean to, um, um, to be poorly blind, um, the grandson, uh, it actually means her poor grandson was blinded. Um, uh, and in this case, in this next example, uh, what this means is whenever poor us would lie down, so those all involve intransitive subjects. It can hit transitive subjects as well. So here uh, from a, a basketball announcing, um, these are all text examples, by the way. So this is from a basketball announcement. Um, and the darn guy overshoots it. So you have this darn um, uh, plugged in with the verb to overshoot. Or, but the darn guy will cause us a failed fire bath. In fact, I was the darn guy. Um, <laughs> 
<coughs> so, and then it also works with objects. So we pluck those baby ones, uh, uh, or uh, them asking for him to just pity the poor one. So Stephen Jacobson has a good take on this, I think. He points out that uh, for uh, the expression visit with darned on it, there actually are three readings. So it can mean he is visiting him, the darned one. It can mean he, the darned one, is visiting him. And it also, Steve Jacobson says, he is visiting him in an irritating way. So there it's really kind of doing what it's supposed to do scope-wise. But uh, I've never encountered this third type, but uh, uh, Steve was working with a somewhat different dialect. But in any case, uh, I think we start to see that it's really a kind of a pragmatic um, uh, uh, thing. So uh, let's see. They, right, so, so basically it, it, it just depends on the, on the, on the context of like where the darn goes. So I think a better model for this, this actually, I think, matches something that we see in um, certain languages um, in Nuchanut or or, uh, uh, or Nutka, um, Sapir has a wonderful paper about what he called abnormal speech. So he said that in speaking to or about a child, it is customary to add the regular diminutive suffix is to uh, to the verb to verb or other forms, uh, even though the word so affected connotes uh, nothing intrinsically diminutive. Affection may also be denoted by it. So to do so, little one, and uh, the Interesting example is this next one, I am going home, little one. So it's just I am going home with this uh, suffix on it. And it has absolutely no, there's no referential um, dimension. Uh, there's, there's no reference for it to attach to. It just simply kind of applies to the addressee. Likewise, though, these aren't necessarily suffixes. So in his, ab among his abnormal speech forms, he says cowards are satirized by speaking in a thin piping voice that suggests timidity when speaking to or about them. So basically, uh, I think that these modifications, um, certainly in, in Nutka and I think also in uh, Yupik, uh, create lects that are evoking or implicating classes of people <clears throat> rather than really allowing the diminutives or other forms to function specifically as operators on their bases. So then, um, the genius of Yupik Inuit um, an elegant orthodox grammatical design um, that through some kind of collective ingen ingenuity um, has been adapted to a very wide range of expressive and semantic uh, complexities stretching to accommodate the, uh, the specific situations of the lexical content involved. And such, a, such situations, I think, often challenge expectations about grammar uh, that are based on languages less exuberant or orthodox in the uh, uh, in, the, uh, in their word formation uh, uh, strategies, and for that reason, all this filled ink. Uh, and finally, the SIN system, I think, is, is, is very seriously amplified uh, to the extent that speakers keep using and liking words with many post bases. All right, so now I'm going to turn to something different. I'm going to turn to Cetino, uh, which has a very, very extensive tonal system that has occupied us for the last for, for quite a while, for the last 10 or more years, I guess. So Chetino is uh, an Otomangayan language spoken in southern Mexico in Oaxaca, as you can see there. It's actually a group of languages. This is a kind of a rundown of uh, Chetino in its context. Uh, it's a Zapotecan language coordinate with Zapotec. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on San Juan Kiaike, uh, Eastern Chetino. And it all started for me. Uh, in, uh, in 2002, when Emiliana Cruz came to our department uh, to study linguistics to get her PhD. Uh, uh, she was actually an anthropology, she studied anthropology and linguistics. And so we started working on her language, and uh, we were joined in the summer teaching in Chetino land by her sister, and she then became a graduate student too, and then Four other people became graduate students, and here they are uh, celebrating the last of the six doctoral defenses on uh, last April. And so, uh, based, and, and uh, each one of them has, has written on a different Chetino variety, so there you see some of the distribution of what has been covered, and we've also been working on other Chetino languages. Um, Emiliana's dissertation, the first of the gang to finish their dissertation, uh, in 2011, 
It was called Phonology, Tone, and the Functions of Tone in San Juan Kiaike Chiquino. And this is what I want to talk about. So she lays it all out here, I think, very well in the following passages. She says, my original intuition was that tones are very important in San Juan Kiaike Chiquino. This dissertation supports this idea by showing that tone carries out a very wide range of functions in San Juan Kiaike Chiquino. Uh, there is a large inventory of lexical tones, and these serve to distinguish words that are segmentally otherwise alike. She says, tone is also central in marking aspect differences and in distinguishing first and second person singular forms of inalienable nouns, predicate adjectives, and verbs from third person base forms. Tone is further signaled and supported through a highly complex Sunday system. And she says, certain tone sequences seem to arise only in morphologically specialized environments. So low, super high only occurs in first person singular inflected forms nowhere else. Um, high to super high is mainly found in borrowed words from Spanish. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so in this language, words are monosyllables except for compounds. Tone, the tone bearing unit is the syllable. So the tones are all on these monomeraic uh, words, uh, 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 quad syllables. And there are 11 tones. And so there's four level tones, four rising tones, and uh, uh, three falling tones. Okay, so just to show you what these look like, here are some averaged pitch tracks of a bunch of rising tones, a bunch of level tones, and a bunch of falling tones. So you can see that they are, really exist. Um, okay, now these 11 tones are uh, form 14 tonal sequences. And ev so every word, uh, not a, a non-compound contains one of these 14 sequences. Now the first uh, sequence is the null sequence, the toneless sequence of each one of those. There are eight single tone sequences. The term sequence may seem like overkill, but uh, uh, I, I, I have a reason to do that. And then there's our five two tone sequences. And uh, the two tone sequences are a little bit disappointing because you can't hear them most of the time because uh, most of the tones are, the, the second tone is almost always a floating tone, a tone that is not realized except when it is uh, followed by a word that is toneless. Um, so just to show you uh, what Emiliana was talking about, she says tone sequences distinguish lexemes. So here you have a bunch of words, you know, fla, 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 and so on. Um, it also marks aspect. So here basically are some aspect paradigms um, for eat, cut it, and count it. You can see these numbers here are the numbers that I've assigned to the sequences, the, the, the basically the ABLA patterns, so there's uh, uh, 1911, 4488, et cetera, and there are about uh, 12 sequences that are well populated and then some other sequences that are kind of irregular. So. Uh, and as you can see, the tone in many cases is doing all the work. So uh, the tone and only the tone very often is what uh, distinguishes the progressive and the habitual aspect. Um, tone also, as Emiliana said, marks uh, subject person. So here are some examples of subject person being marked. You'll notice that the first person singular is also marked by nasalization, but uh, uh, tone alone is what marks the difference to the second person singular. So all of this is to say that tone is doing a lot of work. But this is where it gets interesting. In this uh, chart, which I hope you can fully see, <coughs> uh, we, the, the rows are, each are, are the different tone sequences, and the columns are different functions. So as you can see, yeah, good. Okay, so as you can see here, for basically adjectives, nouns, and verbs, uh, the, uh, there really are only seven or eight, whoops, seven or eight uh, to uh, tone sequences that are doing most of the work. Um, for <coughs> verb aspect, the completive is the same as regular verbs, as you can see, but the progressive has kind of a different cast of characters, and the habitual and potential, whoops, uh, have a different cast of characters. Likewise, for first and second person singular pronouns, a different cast of characters. Take a look here at uh, numerals. Numerals have a really weird cast of characters. There's this tone, this sequence 11, which does numerals and nothing but numerals. And then 
uh, a smattering of others. Uh, Spanish loans also have very specific profiles. So the bottom line is that the tones are functionally quite specialized. Um, so they uh, specialize for marking parts of speech, for marking aspect, person, Spanish loans, and affect. And uh, on affect, maybe you can see that I have an asterisk here. Nouns in class eight are basically only cute animals. Uh, and so, as you can see, we have all of these, uh, these, these um, mid to super high, um, que, sa, y. So you can sort of see why they are good for cute things. I don't know why curses at the bottom there, but, uh, and then there's another tone that is used just for two adjectives that are, uh, uh, that are sort of affective, affective. So q for cute and ti for dear. Okay, so, um, Charles Hockett is famous for talking about duality of patterning, the meaningful elements in any language, the words in everyday parlance, morphemes to us scientists, um, can constitute an enormous stock. Uh, yet they are represented by a small arrangement of relatively small stock of distinguishable sounds, which are themselves wholly meaningless. So Juliet Levins in a recent paper sort of calls him on this saying, well, you know, there are places where uh, where, where that doesn't quite work out. And I would say that this is uh, an example of the kind of thing that Julia was talking about. So you could say that the tones of San Juan Kiaike, arranged in sequences mostly of one, remember, come close to violating this principle by showing um, strongly the property that is known as sound symbolism as they come to mean or implicate particular functions. Okay, so the genius, I think, of San Juan Kiaike Chetino tone is that you have this very large inventory of tones. They're realized uh, compacted on monosyllables. Uh, they have these lexical and grammatical functions, all of this functional uh, specialization. And uh, through that, the emergence of tonal sound symbolism. So it's entirely pervasive in the, in the vocabulary. Now, it's very interesting uh, because we've had the chance to work on many Chetino languages to take a historical perspective on all of this. So the basic story that I would tell here is that uh, in more conservative Chetino languages, you have stems that are actually multisyllabic. So San Juan Kiaike lost all non-final vowels and crushed everything down to a single syllable. And the tone sequences in those um, more capacious uh, Chetino languages are longer, so they can be up to four tones. Um, the uh, tonal sequences themselves um, are compositional, so some prefixes carry tone and they, uh, they add to particular tone sequences. And there are also fewer basic tones in those longer sequences. Um, so basically, the tones themselves are less directly sound symbolic. So now I'm just going to show that to you. So, what we see here is a set of tonal cognate sets for three Chetino languages. San Juan Kieike, which we've been talking about, Sakatepec, which is a very conservative form of Eastern Chetino. It's really close. Uh, as Andrew Garrett would say, it's about as close as Spanish and Portuguese. Um, uh, so it's mutually kind of sort of uh, intelligible. Um, and yet, they look really different as you can see. And then the outlier of the family, Sensontepec, also is multisyllabic, suggesting that Sakatepec is indeed conservative. So look at what happens. I mean, when you look at the uh, scrunched down words of San Juan Kiaike, you can see that there also are these very scrunched down tonal sequences, whereas the tonal sequences are much longer in Sakatepec. Um, in Sensontepec, something entirely different is going on. You can see that they lost most of the tones and uh, ended up with about 60% of the vocabulary just have being toneless and the remainder having just two tones, um, the mid and the high tone. So uh, in that case, uh, the symbolism is almost entirely gone um, uh, that, that I was talking about. Now let's, let's, let's take a look at um, how, the, how all of this works. So um, let's take a look at how the progressive aspect works tonally in these two dialects, San Juan Kiaike and then the more conservative Sakatepec. So um, we have three uh, sets of completive and then progressive. The completive is sort of the unmarked form, the progressive 
um, has something extra. So uh, in the, I want to uh, particularly focus on the row F, where we have a completive that is a completely different tone in San Juan Kiaike as uh, in the green box. And so we want to see where did that come from? How did that happen? So first of all, let's take a look over at Sacatepec. You can see that they form the progressive by putting a prefix nda that has a mid-tone on it uh, just on top of the stem. So it just adds something to the sequence. And you can see that the sequences are embellished there. Over in San Juan Kiaike, where you get no vowel and no extra tone, you just have a, uh, an N and there isn't a uh, tonal prefix. But looking more carefully, if you look at the uh, row F in Sacatepec, you'll see that something happened tonally to the stem. So basically, um, for whatever reason, we don't exactly know what, uh, the prefix is inducing a new tone, a, uh, uh, a, a super rise, a low to super high, uh, on top of what you've already got on that stem. What happened when that got crushed down into um, San Juan Kiaike, that extra tone, is it just gave you a high tone with, a, uh, with an S, and that's a completely unique tonal sequence that only occurs, or I think at one point only occurred, uh, on the progressive. So basically it's the genesis of a new tone. But it didn't only stay as a tone on the progressive. It decided at some, or it was decided at some point, you know, it really sounds a lot like Spanish, that progressive we've got. So all of the uh, earlier Spanish loan words, as you can see here, got that tone. So uh, they have that high tone with a uh, super high floating tone as the marker of, uh, of Spanish loan words. And each different Chitino varieties in Spanish uh, came along after the differentiation of Chitino, picks its own tone to use for Spanish loanwords, and they pick this one in, um, in uh, San Juan Kiaike. And you can tell a similar story about the uh, cute animals. So the, at, at one point, a, a novel form of the, uh, of the habitual and potential aspect cropped up that was a super rise, and it was only, uh, at first, only, a, we can tell this by comparing to other um, more outlying Chitino varieties, it only occurred for the potential mood. But then in Eastern Chitino, including especially in San Juan Kiaike Chitino, nouns started to pick up that tone, and it was only the cute nouns that picked it up because it was such a cute sounding habitual potential. And so, you can basically trace that by looking at all of the different Eastern Chitino varieties and seeing how uh, one by one, um, more and more nouns, different ones in each dialect, start to pick up this cute tone. So the conclusion about the historical context then is that San Juan Kiaike's um, tonal genius can be understood in terms of the retention of the functionality of the morphologically complex tonal system that we got originally in Sacatepec. Um, even as its words were reduced to monosyllables and its tonal sequences were crushed into unanalyzable contours. So uh, in, in that context, particular tones become sound symbolic, allowing for lexical changes that then amplify the pattern. So just a few conclusions very quickly. Uh, we can add a few amendments to the set of recurrent themes that we uh, identified earlier. So. Uh, we can add recursive suffixation among favored properties. We can um, talk about the, uh, 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 the, the, the role of, of, of glitches to favored properties as part of uh, what happens in the context of these properties. We can talk about um, the of patterns of historical retention and change, providing a context in which pervasive patterning and plan start to emerge. Uh, and again, I want to just uh, emphasize that this is a very uh, deliberately open-ended list. So finally, my hope is that discovering genius, novel, pervasive interconnection in grammar and in communicative practice will, uh, will be seen as a goal in its own right and as a creative contribution of people who do extensive, deep linguistic work on languages and language families.
for questions now. Uh, so there are mics set up on both sides, so you can come down and ask. And there's also a curve on the mic if you have someone interested. Tony, I had a question about the UPIC situation where you said that the <coughs> morphological status was very stable, so roots should need to be roots or bases, and post bases can continue to be bases. How do you understand that in the context of this idea of the genius of the language? Well, I think um, we sort of take it as a given, and you can, and by statement, could be wrong if we would, would, if we had been able to go to any point earlier than Eskimo Alley. So by, uh, we can sort of fix it into the, the, the time depth of Eskimo Alley, which is decently long, probably, you know, in the 3,000 year range. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, but, but, but um, you know, it's basically, um, um, I'm sorry, I, I, what was your question? So the question was, yeah. does your way of understanding the orthodox suffixation as part of the genius of the language, oh, yeah. does that explain why they're so stable in their morphological category, or is that separate? I, I think that they're, they're kind of um, dialectical and interdependent. I think that um, something, dr something drives the maintenance of that kind of a, that kind of a system. Um, you can sometimes see little places where, uh, where even that starts falling apart. There's a fantastic example, uh, a set of examples in a paper by Shanley Allen and um, Mary Swift uh, working on, uh, on, on in, uh, Inuit in, in Quebec of uh, parent to child speech where uh, you get gapping out of the base, believe it or not. Normally what you do is you just put a dummy base in its place. So those kinds of uh, of departures from normality, let's say, are gonna, um, gonna, gonna eventually erode this so-called genius, but it's the fact, I think, of the persistence that leads to how worked into the grammar all of this stuff is. Uh, and so it, it's, not, it's, it's, again, it's kind of like Safir's idea of drift. It's something that is, um, uh, that is maybe in the cards to a certain extent, but uh, ultimately depends on practice. Thank you. So, what is the genius of English? <laughs> or French, or Spanish, or German? Yeah, no, um, uh, I, I uh, uh, have a hard time with that. Um, David asked me that, too, a couple of days ago. Um, but I think what, what you'd have to look at is what kinds of things are uh, just sort of really, really recurrent and really um, unusual about it and have deep ramifications. I mean, I just t to toss out a few things, I would say that the uh, incredibly clear and uh, variegated um, forms of complementation that English has enough to obsess um, you know, many generations of, of, of grammarians is, is, is one thing. It really has complicated uh, complementation. Um, uh, the other, another pretty clear thing is its uh, massive vocabulary and its, its uh, acceptance of lots of Loan words. There's actually a whole literature on um, on the genius as appreciated by, uh, say, writers and translators that uh, uh, that that continues to this day. That isn't as much looking at grammar the way we would uh, be doing. But um, I don't know. I, I would say. I'd say also easy changing between nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Sorry, pardon. The fact that they would take very little morphology to change from a noun to a verb to an adjective. Yeah, that would be another one. Yeah, for sure. Jerry. system of another Yupik Inuit language uh, or read about it. I'm consistently struck by the fact that the very same meanings occur over and over again in all these dialects. That's richly documented also in Michael Fortescue's book on the ethics of, of uh, the Inuit Yupik languages. Um, but 
the surprising thing is that while these meanings are stable, every single meaning that you uh, use to illustrate the derivational power of Tufi, every single one of them uh, is represented also in the very uh, spatially and temporally distant um, cadastral suit that uh, Lenora and I are working on. However, the expression of them is quite variable from one language to another, and they're built out of different pieces and they've changed over time. Um, yet the, the stock of meanings, about 500 of them, remains unbelievably stable across space and time. Yeah, and that's even within Yupik dialects, it's like that. So uh, the habitual is tu in uh, some dialects, it's uh, uh, la in others. I mean, they're completely etymologically unrelated, but the, the ideas are exactly the same. They have the same ordering um, uh, 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 characteristics. They're exactly slotted in the same. So what we need to do is to have a kind of a, a diachrony of semantic systems that uh, looks at the systems themselves, uh, the semantic systems themselves, and not just the pieces that fall into those into those meanings. So uh, that part of the genius of this whole language family is um, that you must express these notions suffixally. Yeah. As there are uh, there aren't any grammarians chasing after it, there won't be. So <laughs> it will work. Genius sort of technical question, but it occurred to me while is this on? Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it occurred to me while you were giving the talk. So in, in Chatino, the unique tonal richness arose as a result of the scrunching that obliterated all the vowels, except except for the last one. Um, and uh, it, it was post scrunching that they that the genius of the language realized that. Funny tones would be a cool thing to do to the Spanish loan words as well. But they're all scrunched. Are they, you know, I, I forget what it was, but it was like corazon had turned into, yeah, right. you know, yeah, something. Yeah, right, right. Are, are they still recognizable to them as Spanish loan words, even without most of their vowels and consonants? Most of them are, but I remember arguing with Ilaria and Emiliana about sia, uh, because I, uh, that very one, because corazon and sia don't sound very much alike, but it's sia in some varieties, and Kurasya uh, in some varieties, so I kind of uh, could tell that it just, that was the next step. So there's a kind of a template for a word that just says you're gonna be one syllable, and uh, presumably it wasn't that the, the, the loss of vowels happened, to, happened after Spanish uh, came along. Well, what I mean is, is there a sort of a diachronic ordering paradox here? Like, do they really know that these words are Spanish to put the funny tones on them? I mean, the, 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 the interesting tones emerged after most of the phonology was lost, right? And then they thought, let's apply them to the Spanish loan words. But I'm having trouble believing that at that point, they were, these words were recognizable to them, the Spanish loan words. That's what struck me. Well, I think that in the, in the process of borrowing Spanish, you hear um, prosody, uh, and that prosody then translates into something that seems natural, and so, uh, that, that corpus of loans is really interesting because it has pretty much one treatment in each variety of Chatino, but it's in a different tone class. So they, they don't reconstruct. There just uh, must have been some kind of a nonce assignment at some point. I have a question that is related to Jeff's. Um, it seems like everything brought up is typologically rare, if not unique. And I wonder if you conceive of the idea of a language's genius as being necessarily rare. Um, if we do consider that every language has a genius, is there some kind of 
boring one that is kind of a common strategy for dealing with things. Do you think that that is an interesting question? Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Not, not my question now, but the question what? Uh, I, I think the thing that you could pick out of that is that there may, may be some hegemonic genie um, which are very, very widespread and so don't um, uh, make us uh, take notice. And so, you know, you, you, you typically find that the idea is most intriguing when it unearths something so exotic that it is. Uh, that it, it, it sets you to thinking uh, in typological or in universalistic terms about what might be uh, ultimately going on. Whereas when it's something that's so common, it probably is there, it probably could be perceived from a different point of view, but it's um, just somehow not um, making itself salient to us. Or we've maybe figured out some of the parameters that are involved already, and so we don't really have to um, dig in deep First of all, um, great talk. It was really wonderful. Um, I've been trying to think about how I can figure out the genius of my languages, having heard you. Um, two of the examples you brought up reminded me, I think we were both at the launching of the Gumai and the Kalam grammars in Canberra. It was right when we had our workshop on how to study its own language. And one of the examples is actually, it works out beautifully for making a, a point that I know you would want to make, which is whereas any of us could do the Chattino, you can't do your, your tupic unless you do a certain kind of field work. It seems to me that to really know, and, and particularly the Kalam example about serial verbs and being more analytic <coughs> struck me because in the area where I work in Cameroon, um, there's been this breakdown of the morphology of all the suffixes that mark applicatives and causatives and so forth. And some of the languages have gone for adpositions and some have gone for serial verbs, even though we're sort of out of the serial verb area of West Africa. And the best, and I, and I ask myself the question, why do they do this? And I think it's very much related to, to the Kalam. And I, I got this idea from a dissertation that was done at Buffalo under Jeff Good by Jesse Lovegren, who pointed out that in, um, in that language um, that he worked on, um, you can't just say, drink the wine. Or rather, you could only say that if the person already had it in their hand. So if they had to say, here, drink the wine, you would say, take. You know, pick up, take, right, right, right. and all the things like you showed. Yeah. And you're just saying like this, and this idea that everyone who's worked on serial verbs has been impressed by how you break it down into these logical components, but not why do languages do that? You know, as a, as a way of doing, why do they have all the extra things? And, and in the actual usage, as Jesse Lovegren argues, he says it's really based on the communicative, communicative you know, practices, as you, as, you, as you said. And so um, that's the kind of thing that would be extremely hard to get by doing a licitation and just saying, can you say this, can you say that? I mean, it'd be pretty wise to, to, to sort that out, it seems to me. So um, any, anyway, fantastic work and, and very stimulating, and, um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, uh, just to make a comment, I mean, uh, in his uh, dis descriptions, uh, Andy Pauly basically figured out all of these sort of scenarios for all of these different kinds of actions and he kind of made a, uh, uh, a kind of a formula. And when you look at it, you realize that it's a, it's a, it's a cultural poetics. It's not, a, uh, it's, not, it's not grammar because the grammar is pretty productive. And so if you draw the line at productivity in what you consider to be a lexeme and not, um, then you're gonna slice it much, um, much um, closer than um, if you are going to actually look at the well-formed strings that are there. So, uh, it, I mean, I think that that's something that comes up in Chatino, for example. There's a lot of um, parallelistic oratory, and in daily speech, uh, to sound good, you have to engage in this very, very kind of um, parallelistic uh, kinds of, of, of formulations. And you don't have to do it, but you just sound like you're not as good if you don't.
how to choose them and the auxiliaries and this ordering that has to be just you know in the right place. Um, so could that be maybe the part of the genius of English? And uh, maybe because we are all one English, maybe we just take it for granted and sort of think that maybe that's the default state of language, but maybe maybe it's the genius of English. Yeah. I mean, the one thing, I mean, the, I, I don't want to imply that, you know, that there's going to be one genius of English. I mean, I think it's a scalar concept. You start to see something, and then you see that it has interdependencies of one kind or another, owing to some kind of very, very constant um, recurrent historical practice, or owing to uh, some kind of uh, functional interdependency of the kinds that Heath talks about, or owing to some set of related parametrically related features like Ken was talking about. And you know, you basically can uh, see you know, big ones, medium-sized ones, and small ones. Um, but I, I agree that that's a unique part of English. I agree. Yeah. Gary. Can I be heard without a mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the genius of many of the European languages. One part of it is uh, the uh, strong tendency to hook together two, three, or four words with ordinary meanings to produce something with a completely impenetrable meaning. <laughs> and I, I think this you could call an evil genius. <laughs> <laughs> I could name one in Kardashian suit too, but you know, you, you take some word like good, and, uh, and you have expressions like up to no good, goody goody, goody two shoes, good for nothing, good grief, good night, good for you. Uh, for goodness sakes, my goodness and peanutty goodness and on and on. Peanutty goodness. Uh, the cereal boxes. Uh, oh, it, it's actually your uh, power bar label that you have to read. So, so that really is uh, you know, something about the whole range of Indo-European languages going back to and you, you know, uh, I remember when, when, when I was in Sanskrit class, uh, uh, the blessed Mr. Ingalls, of uh, great memory, um, uh, always pointed out that the classical uh, style for Sanskrit was to make compounds which were paragraphs long. Um, and that the, uh, the, there was a play going on here with the, with the ability of Sanskrit to, to compound in precisely that way, with you know, the four basic flavors of compounding that Bloomfield talks about in language. So it really, I mean, so genius has to be, as it were, as you were pointing out with your examples of the indexicality of uh, Nutka, Nutcha, Nut, yeah. uh, or the other sorts of um, things, the, the fashions of speaking of column and so forth. Um, a, a genius has to be realized in discourse. If it's not realized in discourse, um, it, it is, as you were, your, your answer to the last question about English um, uh, uh, revealed, uh, genius is merely potential. It's never get that, that never tilts in one or another particular direction. What's What's the interesting is I don't think Sapir was totally onto that point. I think that he was uh, really just sort of being the linguist esthete rather than being uh, interested in the aesthetic um, appreciations that were uh, part of it. But the earlier discussions, like Stankiewicz's. Uh, discussions of, of, of uh, Renaissance Italian uses of the term of genius of a language were all about speaker um, uh, aesthetic judgments and perceptions of particular situations. Typically of, of non-linguists, they were always looking at very, very specific kinds of turns of phrases and um, didn't get too deep into the grammatical analysis, but there definitely are, are those two sides of it. Notwithstanding, Sapir said that he was influenced by Croce. Uh, right. <laughs>